The title of the presentation is a bit provocative, but deliberately so, in order to raise a number of questions and see to, to what an extent the current situation as regards legal instruments uh, by the Council of Europe and by the European Union is sufficient, necessary, harmonized, or in need, who knows, of improvement or adjustment. Let me start by saying that I'm honored to be with you today to discuss cross-border cooperation in the light of the Council of Europe's relevant legal instruments and the experience of their implementation. And as I said, we will do it on the basis of my experience and with a view to raising the awareness among political decision makers at both European and national level of the importance of sustaining concrete action at local level with adequate legal, legal framework and capacity building initiatives. I would like to start our presentation by comparing two maps. The first one is a map produced by MOT, the French body that assists local authorities in setting up cross border and international cooperation initiatives, and whose Director General is uh, showing all types of CBC or IPC in Europe on the left side of the table. This is very eloquent. Almost no corner of Europe is void of such a cooperation. My second document, to be seen as a sort of mirroring initiative, is also a map, a table showing the spread of European states' accession to Council of Europe's legal instruments promoting CBC and The lightest area represents the states that have ratified the Samuel Madrid Atlantic Convention, and it covers almost all of Europe. A narrower area covers the states that have ratified the additional, plus the second protocol, and the darkest area, a small one, notwithstanding the huge presence of the Russian Federation, shows the states that also ratified protocol number three. Both maps convey the image of a Europe as a land where cross-border cooperation and dialogue flourish and have become, over time, quite common. The picture would be different if we should eliminate from the first map the cooperation initiatives and bodies prompted by, or financed through, EU structural funds, namely the European Groupings of Territorial Cooperation, also known as AGDCs. I will now show you a table of ratifications where you can see nose to nose the countries that have implemented EU Regulation 1082 on EGTC and those that have ratified Protocol Number 3 to the Madrid Convention on Euro Regional Cooperation Groupings or ECGs. It's a strong on the right, the pink column on the right, and the grey column in the middle. Both EGDCs and ECGs have the same purpose and very similar legal features to be found respectively in Regulation 1082-2006, as modified by Regulation 1302-2013, and Protocol Number 3 of 2009. But while Regulation 1082 covers all EU member states, following the adoption by the European Parliament and the Council. Protocol number three has to be ratified by Council of Europe member states, parties to the Madrid Convention, and not necessarily the previous protocols. And this has only happened in seven states so far. One question would then be, is protocol number three not really nearly necessary only for EU states, at least, or is it aimed primarily at non-EU member states? Significantly, of the seven states bound by it, the Russian Federation and, and Ukraine are not EU states. I will provide my answer to this question. But let's first discuss the Madrid Convention, the mother of all conventions and regulations pertaining to the cross border cooperation in Europe. The Madrid Antoine Convention was opened for signature in 1980. And as you know, the opening of signature of the convention is the culmination of a long diplomatic negotiation which, in the case of the NOC, started in 1975. Dates are important. They point a specific moment in history when the need was felt to free, so to speak, local authorities from exaggerated or unnecessary constraints and let cooperation develop across the borders from the bottom at local authorities' level and not just at the top between some states. The Europe was in the making 
having completed the customs union and abolished internal barriers to trade, I handled the Treaty of Rhodes thanks to and was set to win popular support and show that it was delivering freedom of movement and economic prosperity to all its citizens, irrespective of borders. This was also the time of repeated claims that the European Parliament be elected at last by universal suffrage. Also it happened in 1979. There was a symbolic pretense in the flattery of borders, at least as far as the cooperation between neighboring local authorities was concerned. After all, borders had been drawn and redrawn across Europe following the murderous wars so many times that they had also become not only legally intangible but morally inviolable. And 1975 was also the year of the fateful CSC conference in Helsinki. So the convention was drawn up with the support of European ministers responsible for local state government and adopted by the Committee of Ministers, which represents the foreign. The Madrid Convention did not grant local authorities the right to engage in cross-border cooperation, but rather requested the contracting parties, the states, to facilitate and foster it. It surrounded this modest engagement with reservations and constraints, which the parties could use, such as the right of the state to exclude <coughs> some categories of local authorities from the sea, or to grant this possibility only to municipalities falling within a stretch of land at the borders, or the right of the state to conclude bilateral agreements with the neighboring states before letting their local authority to stop this cooperation. Notwithstanding these restrictions, fully understandable from the point of view of central states, the Madrid Convention proved very successful. States not only ratified it in earnest, Ten ratifications in the first six years, at a time when the Council of Europe mem membership was 17 states, but also used very sparingly the possibilities they had to exclude entities or limit territorial strips. As to the conclusion of bilateral or multilateral conventions, I would call them enabling conventions, it happened, but with a view to expanding and facilitating the cooperation as defined in the new scene, and not restricting. This is the case of the first Benelux Convention and the Isselburg and Old and Mines Treatise, which in turn inspired the additional protocol to the Madrid Convention on the legal status of civil workers, which again sparked a new wave of bilateral and multilateral treaties, namely the Bayonne, Kamsrud, Brussels, and Valencia treaties, plus the second Benelux Convention, containing practical and concrete modalities for effective cross border initiatives. Both. In fact, only three bilateral treaties concluded between Italy and France, Switzerland and Austria were, at the time, examples of precautionary treaties, framing, if not limiting, local authorities' access to cross-border cooperation. Significantly, Italy never discussed a similar treaty with its fourth neighbor, Yugoslavia, or after 1993 with Slovenia. And for the sake of completeness, also Azerbaijan, Georgia, Malta, Romania, Serbia, and Slovakia made similar declarations at the time of their ratification. In one respect, the Madrid Convention did not succeed, as its authors had hoped. The model agreements drawn up by the Council of Europe to serve as source of inspiration for local authorities and published in the immediate aftermath of the Convention remained mostly unused and were abandoned. The MOC therefore proved to be a little test of trust between local authorities and the state, and a proving ground of the former's capability to engage in CBC while respecting the state's sovereign foreign policy. In a matter of years, what had been foreseen as a facility granted to local authorities became a right to enter into CBC cooperation and agreements enshrined in both the European Charter of Local Self Government, 1985, and the Additional Protocol, 1995. My first conclusion is, therefore, that the MOC has been a sort of prophetic document that has been used enthusiastically, I'd say, as witnessed by the blossoming of initiatives from twinning of cities to structured dialogue and cooperation, which is impossible to number. 
The Council of Europe started collecting such information, also in the light of the obligation of the states to inform the Secretary in general about such initiatives, but had to give up, the data being too numerous and the states losing control. This map, produced recently by the Association of European Border Regions, whose Director General is also with us today, shows in a quite relevant way the extension today of cross border initiatives. If the Madrid Convention proves so successful and also, so to speak, so innocuous for the sovereignty of states, why have some Council of Europe member states not yet ratified it? It is not my intention to deal with some of the regions each state has without doing it. But I would recall that, that for some reason, i.e. post 1989, member states ratifying the Convention is an accession commitment still to be honored. Lack of ratification does not prevent local authorities and communities from effectively cooperating across the board, as this map shows, including in street. But ratification would provide legal security for municipalities and for states, open the way to the acceptance and ratification of the subsequent protocols, whose practical scope and legal ambitions are equally important. Protocol number two is, so to speak, the least contentious, inasmuch as it equates cooperation between non adjacent local authorities, the so called interterritorial cooperation, to cooperation between local authorities having a border in common, the so called transfrontier cooperation in the Council of Europe Parliaments. In the EU terminology, they are called respectively cross border and transnational cooperation. Yet, its acceptance record is not particularly brilliant. And I would say that there is scope for additional ratification. Protocol number three is, however, another story, which, without consuming too much of your time, is worth recording. The story begins in the early years of the last decade, 21st century first, <coughs> when, in response to the request of a many Central East European states, the possibility of drawing up a single European statute for EU regions was. The roots of the problem are manifold and lay in the adequacy inadequacy of both additional protocol and domestic legislation in regard of the legal nature of such EU regions. The additional protocol allows for the establishment of cross border or even interterritorial cooperation bodies whose legal capacity and operations will be determined by the law of the state where the body has its headquarters. It could be public law, private law, and have powers linked to the exercise of public authority or not. These distinctions are not unknown in the legal order of Central and East European member states, but their rule books differ a lot and are often defective or short of available option when it comes to choosing the headquarter state. Hence, the invitation addressed to the Council of Europe to draw up a sort of single uniform statute for cross border youth cooperation bodies that would be adopted as such by all states interested without passing through the stages of comparing and amending civil codes, local authorities' laws, or both. The Council of Europe started working on this new treaty in July 2004 shortly before the European Commission tabled, it, tabled its proposal for a regulation, later to become Regulation 1082, whose content and purpose were also to unify the EU law applicable to a new type of cross-border cooperation body. Did the European Commission wish to encroach upon a territory where the Council of Europe had exclusive initiatives so far having regard to the new competencies granted to the Union by the Lisbon Treaty? It is possible. And as it is customary in the EU lawmaking process, once this one proposal is launched, it almost inevitably goes to its end. Subject to a number of changes and additions, in particular the change of name from Transfrontier to Territorial Cooperation, the regulation was adopted before the Council of Europe had finished discussing its draft convention. The latter, therefore, had to abandon 
it pretends to draw up a single uniform statute of EU regions, well, after all, there was not one for the EU member state, and refocused on a shorter text with added value and a detailed appendix with all the features of the uniform statute. The latter was produced in 2011 and updated in 2013. The former became protocol number 3 in 2009 in Utrecht and entered into force in 2032. The existence of two similar but not identical instruments reflects on the one side the political power of the EU that wanted its regulation and got it. And on the other, the counterweight of the Council of Europe of non-EU states that also wanted a tool applicable to them and not too different from the EU, which the EU graciously granted, not without resistance. <coughs> In fact, while the core provisions on organs, supervision, budgets, staff, auditing, etc., are almost identical, the ECG has a much broader scope than the EGTC, anchored in local authorities' competences. The latter must retain the majority of voting rights in the ECG, or else be dissolved. Also, territorial authorities of a non-party state may take part in the setting up of the ECG, or accede to it, provided this state has a common border in the state where their borders are located. And last but not least, Territorial authorities of the various member states need not have identical functions according to domestic legislation in order to become members of the ECG. It suffices that the ECG is given tasks that are compatible with the powers of the local authorities that are member states. Once these differences are highlighted, it looks as if the body to be set up for the purpose of meeting the goals or missions of regulation 1082 can be an ECG. In other words, a body whose legal features are those of Protocol 3, which are broader, not narrower, than those of an EGTC, and therefore fully compatible with regulation 1082. And since the authority entitled to approve the EGTC is the state and not the European Commission, it may well prefer that the requirements for an EGTC follow those of an EGTC. Just two examples. The use of languages in the EGC is broader and more in conformity with the requirements of multilingual and multi ethnic states than the EGTC. And in the case of a litigation with a third party, an ECG may and sometimes must have recourse to out of court arbitration, which is legally more secure and faster than in court litigation. My conclusion would therefore be that for both EU and non-EU states, the ratification of Protocol 3 would not be superfluous in relation to the EGC, but would expand the choice of legal solutions available to local authorities. Let me insist on another point. For the adoption of Protocol Number 3, only the previous ratification of the Convention is necessary, not that of any of the other two protocols. This is important, because the solutions of the addition of protocol are complicated in practice, but we don't need to be a party to this protocol in order to accede to protocol number three. And finally, for states not yet a member of the EU, protocol number three would be an excellent testing ground for the establishment and functioning of cooperation bodies that could, upon accession to the EU, later acquire the legal status and capacity also of energy. <laughs> Conversely, for states no longer belonging in the EU, and I'm thinking of the United Kingdom, the Madrid Convention on Protocol Number 3 would be the only way to be safely anchored to cross-border and cross-channel cooperation with the rest of you. And let me conclude. Council of Europe legal instruments on cross-border cooperation remain, notwithstanding the passing of time, and with a small reservation regarding additional protocol, superseded, so to speak, by the more elaborate protocol number three, relevant and useful, they are in competition with regulation 1082, but at a closer look, this needs not to be the case. They will show 
all the member states of the Council of Europe on the left, those which have ratified the Madrid Convention immediately, the first column on the right, additional protocol, protocol number two, protocol number three. So you, you see that the vast majority of member states have ratified the Madrid Convention, with few exceptions of the bottom, Greece, United Kingdom, the former US Republic of Macedonia. But in comparison to that, the vast majority has accepted the Madrid Convention. Half those states have also accepted additional and second protocol, but only seven have accepted protocol no. three. So it is quite telling as to the work that remains to be done. But again, you can jump, the country can jump from the Madrid Protocol to protocol number three without necessarily accepting the two in between. This is, I think, the state of play, and I will not go deeper on in comparing basically the ECG and, and the, the, the European Union instrument, but I think it should suffice to say that the two are compatible. This is what was wanted, especially requested by our member states. They are compatible, they can be chosen indifferently, and depending on whether you are in the EU or not, you have a choice. If you are not, you don't have the choice that you take. Protocol number three, but protocol number three is a good prefiguration of what you could still be doing once you join the European Union and you use the same legal framework you have just agreed and you declare it is the EGTC. So, practically, once you have protocol number three and bodies set up according to protocol number three, you can also have them recognized as the EGTCs for the purpose of EU legislation. 